<laughs> and Audrey, I just want to add my thanks for organizing these programs. We've all gotten so much out of it. Okay, do you think that we can begin now? Okay, so let's begin with our bracha for study. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Okay, so today uh, we, are, we are exploring parashat Shmini, and the parasha begins v'yahi b'yom hashmini, and that's how it gets its name. Um, and Shmini means the eighth, the eighth day. On the eighth day following the seven days uh, of the inauguration is, uh, of the priests, the ordination of the priests, uh, of the priests, uh, Aaron and his sons begin to officiate as Kohanim. And it's also the official inauguration of the Mishkan. And you would think, okay, so it's the beginning words of the Parsha, but why, what is the significance of the eighth day b beyond uh, the naming of the Parsha? So first, perhaps the priests are undergoing a kind of new Brit, akin to the Brit Milah that takes place for every healthy Israelite male on the eighth day after his birth. There is a Brit with God to be to become the custodians of the spiritual life of the people, to maintain and enact the covenant through the people's ritual life, um, which is the korbanot, the sacrifices and the rituals within the Ohel Moed and the tent of meeting and what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now, the sacrifices and uh, the korbanot. Next, uh, at the beginning of the eighth day, at the end of Shabbat, we enact a ritual of Havdalah, which marks the boundary between the orderly time of the six days of creation, uh, where God created the world and the sacred time of Shabbat. On the eighth day, um, the boundary uh, between the order of those six days of creation and Shabbat and the beginning of humankind's creation and management of the world happens. And that's the beginning of prosaic and mundane realities, which are a lot messier. Um, another reason is once the sanctuary, once the Mishkan is completed, uh, in this Parsha, a new spatial boundary is created. The Mishkan, with its, all its partitions and its different details, represents a boundary making in space. So it's another reason for the eighth day. And finally, in this Parsha, we receive the essential laws of Kashrut, the dietary laws, the boundary making in life between the act of eating, the most natural of human activities is now brushed with holiness and uh, is separated between the careless, profane consumption, which is devoid of distinctiveness and mindfulness. So the eighth day is a pivotal uh, separation uh, in many ways between, uh, in boundaries. So it's worthwhile paying attention to that. So on this day, also, we should note that the entire community, men, women, and children, kol ha'ida, it makes a point of saying that, which is not always the case with the uh, saying, who's going to be there? Oftentimes, it says, v'yidaber Moshe el b'nei Yisrael. The uh, uh, Moshe will speak to the children of Israel, and Bnei Israel is usually interpreted as the male folk, the men folk. But here it's very specific. It says, Kol Haida, the whole community, came forth to witness the ritual, and the many korbanot are offered on this day, eighth day. It is significant that everyone witnesses the ordination of the Kohanim and the attendant sacrifices. There is a sin offering, a people's uh, offering, an offering of well-being, shlamim, etc. And Aharon, the Kohen Agadol, puts his hands up, 
and I can't do it because I was clearly not a Kohen. I can't get this finger over there. Um, and does the beer cut? Thank you, Shlomo. You clearly are a Kohen, obviously, um, from your surname and from your ability to do that. And Luther, you could do it too. You know, where you got that, God knows. <laughs> Um, uh, and he, and that Birkata Kohanim, as we know, is still enacted. What is that? You got it in the mikvah. You got it in the mikvah. <laughs> okay. And it's still enacted today with great pomp and circumstance. Now, all of Aharon's, uh, sons who are to be priest witness this pomp and circumstance and all the korbanot and the ordination of the priest and the inauguration of the Mishkan. Um, uh, and two of them in particular seem to have been very, very struck by it and deeply affected and that those were Nadav and Avihu. So if you can put up the share, uh, share screen and we're going to look at the first um, text. It's just a couple of lines. And let's read what it says here. Now Aharon's sons, Nadav and Avihu, each took his fire pan, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered before the Lord alien fire, Esh Zarah, which could be strange fire, alien fire, which he... Uh, yud -Hey had not enjoined upon them. And fire, asher lo otam. And fire came forth from the Lord and consumed them. Thus they died at the instance or before Lifnei uh, Adonai. Then Moshe said to Aharon, this is what yud -Hey -Hey meant when he said, though to, through, the, through those near to me, be krovai e kadesh, I show myself holy and gain glory before all the people. And Aharon was silent. Could you go up a little bit? Now we, we notice that the word bikrovai is from the same root as korban, kufreshvav, vet, excuse me. Uh, I become holy through my korbanot. So what is, we have to ask a couple of questions here. What is this Esh Zarah, this strange alien fire that God had not commanded, Asher Lotzi Va'otam? First, the fire is alien or strange because it did not come as a result of a divine mitzvah. And thus there was no holiness attached to the offering. Second, it was not administered in the proper way under one of the designated rubrics of the things we have been talking about, the Ola, the Chatat, the Zevach Shlamim, etc. There was no category for the offering brought by Nadav and Avihu, and thus there was no order. Um, it was out there uh, without an orderly uh, designation for it. We know that Nadav and Avihu had witnessed this amazing ritual, but we didn't see any um, mitzvah attached to it. Now we have to ask this question, what does this puzzling phrase, Bikrovaya Kadesh, what is the korban that is emerging from the Esh Zara, if there is one? Um, one question, and this is uh, a very interesting one, is, um, is God saying that the korban, the krovai, are Nadav and Avihu themselves? This is one theory about, about them. Is God saying that because they came close through their offering and were burned up, and, he, and God burned them up, God's holiness and power was demonstrated. Um, if we read the next, oh, it's not here. Let me, uh, I forgot to put it in there, so let me just read it for you. Um, I have it. Uh, oh, no, 
no, here it is. It is. Here it is. Three to five. I'm sorry. I just was a mistype, a typing in my notes. Um, who was saying that? Uh, Shlomo, did you say that you had it? Could you read the number two here, Leviticus 10, three to five? No. Sure. Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, come forward and carry your kinsmen away from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. They came forward and carried them out by their tunics, as Moshe had ordered. Now, the emphasis was by their tunics. That was my emphasis. It's not in the text itself. But the question arises, um, if indeed Nadav and Avihu were all burned up, how is it that their tunics were not pulverized along with them? That's an interesting question. Were they pulverized, but their tunics are not? It, the image that I get is Mishael and El Safan are literally picking them up by their tunics and carrying them out. But in a korban, uh, the whole animal or the whole creature is burned up. So is what the only thing that's left of them uh, their tunics. Um, there are many other interpretations of this uh, strange phrase, Bikrovaya Kadesh, and I don't have an answer to the tunics question, but it seems strange to me. Um, Through those near to me, I show myself holy and gain glory before all the people. And there's a particularly striking uh, uh, interpretation by the preeminent medieval Midrashist Rashi, um, who cites a Talmudic midrash, which sees a foreshadowing of Nadav and Avihu's fate in this divine proclamation. The Talmud says that Moshe understands the phrase to mean, I will be sanctified through those who are glorify me, and he interprets these words as a dire prediction. The inauguration of the Mishkan service will be sanctified by the ultimate sacrifice of those individuals who are closest to God, those people, individuals who are closest to God. This is still the Talmud. Moses secretly harbors this premonition until in the aftermath of the death of Nadav and Avihu, he turns to his brother Aharon and says, Aharon, my brother, I have known that the Mishkan would be sanctified by those closest to God, and I assumed that it would be either you or me. Now I know that Nadav and Avihu are greater than me or you. So that the Korban here, uh, the Talmud is saying, the Korbanot here are Nadav and Avihu, and that Moses knew it already in a premonition. So according to this, Moshe is comforting his brother by underscoring the overwhelming spiritual greatness of Nadav and Avihu. He hopes, as those comforting mourners often do, that Aaron will find solace in the contemplation of his son's lives rather than their deaths. Moshe is telling Aharon that the two young men died al kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's name, a sanctification of the greatest order, a korban of the highest order. Then on the heels of this message to Aharon, Moshe tells his brother Aharon and Aharon's sons not to mourn publicly and that the people will mourn on their behalf and Aharon is silent. Now, this is not, I want to acknowledge, this is not the majority view. It is a minority view. And the majority view is that Nadav and Avihu did something terribly wrong and that it was a punishment for that. Asher lo tziva Adonai, it was not commanded by God and it was not within the order of things, uh, this, this uh, offering of some kind. And we'll see later another possible reason for it. But the fact that Rashi, the greatest of the medieval Midrashists, and the fact that the Talmud bring this suggests that there might have been a much more profound, noble, 
uh, reason for Nadav and Avihu to have uh, done their act. So now let's look at the source sheet um, for uh, uh, for Aharon, Aharon's silence. And so Moses said to Aharon and to his sons Eleazar, Eleazar and Itamar, do not bare your heads and do not rend your clothes lest you die and anger strike the whole community. But your kinsmen, all the house of Israel, shall bewail the burning that the Lord has wrought. And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting lest you die, for the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. And they did as Moshe had, bid, had bidden. So there are a couple of things. There is what my medieval professors used to use the Latin phrase. There's an argumentum ex silencio, an argument from silence. Nowhere in the text does it designate which sons would be anointed as priest. We assume that all of them would be, but and and we were we know that Elaz Eleazar and Itamar were anointed, but there's also a hint here, perhaps, that for some reason Nadav and Avihu might not have been. As anointed priests, they are public figures, Eleazar, Eleazar and Itamar, and Aharon, of course, and that they're according to Halakha of this time, which was not, of course, a halakha that was well developed, but it was understood that the Kohen Gadol is um, prohibited, and his, his sons, the Kohanim, are, they are prohibited from mourning in public. And Moshe is reminding them of that at that time. So our own silence could be that uh, he is simply following as the Kohen Agadol what is expected of him according to the Minhag and later the Halakha of their time. It could be as profound and also as simple as the fact that Aaron was in shock. Here two of his sons are dead and he is in such, he's stunned into silence. Um, but it could also be that he himself, now here it's, this is where Rashi and the Talmud come back in, it's anachronistic, but it could be that Aaron is accepting on some very, very deep internal level that Nadav and Avihu are not simply playing around with fire and not simply doing something that has not been divinely commanded, but that they are indeed giving themselves so, over. They have given themselves over al kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's name and that their deeds speak for themselves. Their deaths then come from a whole, for, a, for a holy purpose and Aaron needn't say a word. Perhaps Aaron is silent because he knows the demands of his public position also. He, he understands profoundly that his sons, perhaps he understands profoundly that his sons have given themselves over for Kiddush Hashem. But also he understands that he, um, he, is the representative of the spiritual life and the emotional life and condition of the people. According to Rashi's grandson, Rashbam, Rabbi Shmuel, Shmuel ben Meir, who's an early 12th century uh, scholar, Torah scholar and Midrashist, Moses reminded Aharon of the difficult challenge he was faced with, uh, faced with reflecting God's law that he is not permitted to demonstrate uh, his mourning and his grieving. By following the law, by courageously refraining from public mourning, despite his overwhelming uh, grief, Aaron, Aaron too would be publicly sanctifying God's name. He would go, be going uh, not so much in a kiddush Hashem in the sense of giving himself over as a korban, in the way that his two sons did in an elevated way, 
but he would continue to serve and would fulfill God's mandate that God be publicly sanctified through actions of those nearest to God. And therefore, God would be glorified amongst the entire nation. Aaron was silent, summoning all his strength. Aaron refrained from openly mourning his sons, and thus the sons and the father each came closest to God and glorified God. Bikrovai Ekadesh. Now, I'm also reminded in our modern context, um, I was 13 when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And I am reminded of Jacqueline Kennedy's behavior during that time, of ultimate dignity and ultimate um, decorum in public. And then in the memoirs of those closest to her during that time, they said that she would be completely dignified and maintain this tremendous decorum in public. And the minute she would get back to the White House or then to her private residence, she would sob mightily. She would fall on her bed and sob mightily. When later she was asked about this whole time, she said, I understood that I was the custodian of the people's grief and that if I fell apart, the nation would fall apart. It was my responsibility to hold the grief of the nation. In that sense, she was a modern example of what Aharon was doing. Now let's get back to the whole question of silence. Silence in the Jewish tradition and silence in other traditions. There's more to silence in the Jewish tradition and in other teachings. Rabbi John Sommer teaches, the tradition suggests an understanding of Aharon's silence as something which transcends unquestioning obedience. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav reflects that silence is a higher form of engagement with the world and with God and can move us beyond more limiting forms of communication and expression. Reb Nachman says, in youth, one learns to talk. In maturity, one learns to be silent. This is the human problem, that we learn to talk before we learn to be silent. Speech signifies comprehensibility. Melody, nigunim, are beyond language, expressing moods which words cannot describe. Yet silence is even higher. As we accompany the mourner, or even as we seek to address loss in our own life, Reb Nachman identifies here one hierarchy of engagement. Speech, melody, and silence. This framework allows us to engage with others and with our experience at different levels in a situationally appropriate ways. Our own loss is profound. What words would be sufficient? What songs could possibly be appropriate? In his silence, however, we can read much. We can read shock. We can read obedience to God. We can read a faith and the belief that there is a faith that that there is a faith uh, in a higher purpose. And Luther asked, can silence be a form of rebuke? Absolutely. It could be part of what we call uh, chutzpah klapei shamayim, chutzpah towards heaven and arguing with God, um, saying, why did you do this? What, where is the justice in this? Absolutely. We have that, of course, in the book of Job where Job argues with God and said, I have done nothing wrong. Why have you brought this adversity, this tragedy, this misery upon me? It certainly can be rebuke. There's no question of that. However, it can also be what we have in the Psalms, l'cha dumia tehila, to you silence is praise. Aharon, the Kohen Hagadol, even with his most profound loss, is also a man of profound faith, who in his silence is offering God profound praise 
and communicating with God that he will continue to serve in the way that is necessary and expected of him. Kohelet, Rabbi Sommer suggests, tells us in word and in verse structure that birth is not judged better than death and that speaking is not necessarily preferred to silence. Rather, what we judge to be good or bad may reflect our own individual and cultural biases, and that if we are silent and listen, we might gain a new understanding. In our most central prayer, Rabbi Sommer suggests to us, we say, Shema Yisrael, listen, O Israel. We do not say, speak, O Israel, or even sing, O Israel. Silence and hearing are core values and do not necessarily just denote obedience, but can suggest a call to understanding through silence's own capacious realm. Aaron is listening for the deeper meaning of his son's death. In the Buddhist tradition, articulated by Hermann Hesse in Siddhartha, to these two sentiments are, implicit, are, are similar to those implicit in Kohelet. Hesse explores, explores what can be held in our consciousness about the world through silence and listening. The protagonist's moment of enlightenment echoes Kohelet's suspension of judgment regarding human experience. Siddhartha listened. He was now nothing but a listener, completely concentrated on listening. Already, he could no longer tell the many voices apart, not the happy ones from the weeping ones, not the ones of children from those of adults. They, are all, they all belong together. The lamentation of yearning and the laughter of the knowledgeable one, the scream of rage and the moaning of the dying ones, everything was one. Everything was intertwined and connected and tangled a thousand times. And everything together, all vices, all goals, all yearning, all suffering, all pleasure, all that was good and evil, all of this together was the world. All of it together was the flow of events, was the music of life, and he listened to it all. Hermann Hesse, Reb Nachman and Kohelet suggest that silence and listening are means through which additional levels of discernment can come to us and our presuppositions may be re-examined. Our own experiences direct divine communication, perhaps not because of unthinking obedience, but through the potential held by the silence itself. In silence, we can sometimes discover deeper meaning or serve as accepting presence during a companion's time of grief. In comprehending what silence may hold for us, we might gain comfort using it to convey empathy and understanding or simply to honor the pain of loss. I'm looking at the, uh, at the chat. Silent and listen. Ha, huh, that's interesting. Barb says, silent and listen are anagrams, have the same letters. Be silent so you can listen. It's a very wonderful perception. Thank you. Can't help of, help of thinking of Zelensky in Ukraine, who is holding the grief of the Ukrainian people. He is far from silent, but at the same time, he is also holding a lot and not speaking of his own suffering. He's speaking of the suffering of, of, his, of the entire people. Yes, one or two comments and then we'll go on to the next section of the Parsha. Shlomo? You had earlier raised a question about how come the tunics didn't burn. Mm -hmm. And as I think about it, weren't the garments of the Kohanim also considered to be holy. Yes. And so the fire of God did not want to consume that which is holy, although the Kohanim themselves were not considered to be holy. So I just wanted to make that comment about tunic, but I have another, another more serious issue. And that's this whole emphasis of dying al-Kiddush Hashem 
which to me flies in the face of the Akedah, where our God is saying to Abraham, I'm not interested in anybody dying in, in service to me. Don't sacrifice yourself. So I don't know what to make of that, but uh, the writers are giving us an interesting contradiction to play around with and talk about. Right, and it's certainly, I would say there's a dialectical uh, quality to what's going on. There's a dialogue going on in Torah about these stories and what happens around this. Absolutely. Camilla, and then we'll go on. Uh, you're muted, Camilla. Yeah, I was just unmuting. Yeah, I, first I just wanted to thank you for bringing up this other interpretation, which to me makes so much more sense. I was always disturbed by this interpretation that they had done something wrong and that was why they were killed. And this really, you can see it right in the text as you, know, as you pointed out what Moses said would you know, back that up with the, I, I wonder, I really wonder if they pushed the, the, that they did something wrong explanation because they wanted to control the people and they were afraid um, of putting out there that they, they, they had died because they got too close to God. I think that the, the rabbis certainly uh, uh, emphasize the negative uh, actions here and the wrongdoing because they are trying to advance the notion that as Jewish law gets more and more evolved and more and more developed, they want people to stick strictly to it. And they see the line, Asher lo tziva otam, that God has not commanded them as key to this phrase. And uh, in their eyes, Nadav and Avihu had not been commanded to uh, bring this fire, and that was wrong. That was simply wrong, and they wanted to make sure that the people knew that it was wrong and that this was punishment. Um, and, uh, and so they want to emphasize the negative of this and they can't possibly see any other positive uh, solution for it. But I found it astounding when I studied this that both Rashi and the Talmudist would come up with this very, not only positive, but very noble uh, mo motivation that elevated Nadav and Avihu even av above Moshe and Aharon. <laughs> I, I thought that was was really astounding. Yeah. Okay, Frana has something to say from and the. That is, if you think at the times of when the Talmudists were writing, and when Rashi was writing, what had they just experienced in the last couple centuries? Right. Well, it's very martyrdom. That, Jewish well, martyrdom. That's right. That's very important. That's a thank you. That's a very good comment. Rashi is writing in the 11th century, and almost just a few decades after the Crusaders had marauded through the Rhine district of Germany, and had uh, had massacred many hundreds of Jews um, for their. Um, uh, for not converting to Christianity and trying to force them to Christianity. And in a couple of those towns, in Mainz and Speyer, the Jews died al Kiddush Hashem. They committed suicide rather than um, converting to Christianity. And, and, uh, and what that meant was that they were elevated into the uh, canon of Jewish belief as holy martyrs. So it's it's so for Rashi, this was a very very uh, cogent and very very relevant example. But for the Talmudists, it's not it's not timely. It's much the Talmudists is centuries earlier. So uh, go explain it from that perspective. It's, uh, it's, uh, well, Frana, if you want to join the class, come join the class, but otherwise you can't be in the peanut gallery so much. <laughs> <laughs>
we got to get some control here. Um, <laughs> all right, one more comment, and then we're going to go on. Shlomo? Yeah, in the Talmud, I I'm interested in hearing that the co that the Kohen, if I understood correctly, is not supposed to mourn? That's correct. Well, you know, when my father died, I sat Shiva and I mourned, and I'm a Kohen. I mean, I don't get it. Because in the Talmud... You're not a Kohen at all. Uh, that, that's definitely true. But <laughs> in the Talmud, if we're talking about the Talmudists, somebody who was a mourner, I mean, our, our honoring the dead is so important that mourners are exempt from fulfilling other mitzvot. That's right. And so, I mean, where does this whole notion of honoring the dead, I guess in the interpretations of Rashi that you gave us, uh, but I, I, I see this honoring the dead as one of the strongest traditions and uh, principles in our tradition, such that mourners are exempt from fulfilling other mitzvot. Yes, in this case, the people, the entire people are going to mourn the deaths of Nadav and Avihu on the behalf of the priestly family. So it's not that they aren't going to be mourned, they're going to be mourned en masse in very, very strong ways. Okay, we're going to go on because I'm conscious of time. Let's, let's look at number four on the sheet. Can someone please read this one? I'll do it. This is Nancy. Thank you. Um, Leviticus 10, 8 through 11. And the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, drink no wine or other intoxicant. You or your sons when you enter the tent of meeting that you may not die. This is the law for all time throughout the ages, for you must distinguish between the sacred and the profane and between the clean and the unclean. And you must teach the Israelites all the laws which the Lord has imparted to them through Moses. So one, many of the interpretations that take the, this is a little bit more of a response to you, Camilla, about uh, the negative interpretation of Nadav and Avihu is that they were drunk that they got, they got so excited by all the pageantry and everything else, they got drunk and they just in a rip roaring drunken state brought their fire pans and brought their own sacrifice or brought their own offering and got pulverized in the process. So where else do we see, where else do we see uh, an admonition against inebriation? We see it in Noah. We see it at the, when after the flood and Noah comes out from the ark and there's dry land and the first thing he does is he brings an offering and then he, he plants a vineyard, he plants grapes and when, the, and when the grapes are ripe, he makes them into wine and he gets rip roaring drunk and he falls into his tent, naked into his tent, his youngest son Ham, Ham comes along and, and sees this and goes running out of the tent to the older brothers, Shem and Yafet, Shet and Yafet, and, and says to them, look at our, our father. And they go in with a blanket and backwards so that they don't see him naked. And there's a whole story that comes out of that. And there's a whole uh, thing about inebriation there. So what's, what's the common denominator between the two stories here. It seems to me that this is, first of all, it's a priestly document, we know that, but we seem to, just from the point of, uh, of biblical criticism, it seems that this is a later text. And if it's a later text, what, what, what's, it seems to me, and this is my own thinking about it, that this is a way to explain Nadav and Avihu's behavior. And it doesn't have to do necessarily with what's really going on in the text. I am very attracted, and this is my own personal opinion, I'm very attracted to the Kiddush Hashem uh, interpretation and to Rashi and to the Talmud. Um, but that's my own 
my own subjective view. So I wonder what's, what's going on here besides the fact that it might be a late text trying to uh, 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 negativize Nadav and Avihu anymore. What might be the common denominator between the two stories, the Noah story and the um, Nadav and Avihu story? Um, uh, Audrey? Well, it seems to me that a lot of it has to do be doing with paying respect and being in control. And in both cases, these characters are perceived as being out of control and not being respectful to the circumstance. And as a result, bad things happen. Um, that's kind of what I take away from it. I think, I think you're very much on the right track because what immediately follows this is a long discursus on kashrut. Hmm. And we wonder to ourselves, after all of this stuff that's there, why suddenly do we now start having this entire section um, about Kashrut? Uh, after all, all the stuff it, it, it has, in, in chapter 11, there are creatures that you may eat from, and it goes on and on to say what you can have, and which ones are chewing their cuds, and which ones are, are, have hoofs, and which ones don't have hoofs, and which swarming things you can eat, and which things you can't eat, and what's an abomination, and jointed legs, and unjointed legs, and it goes on for an entire chapter. So the question becomes, why suddenly are we now having all this stuff about kashrut? And it seems to me that what this is about is our boundaries again, about what's orderly and what's not orderly. And um, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs goes right there. What he says is that boundaries, are, that this entire section, the entire world is becoming a more boundaried place. And the boundaries start with the priesthood. That the priests are the symbols of boundaries. The priest with all the rules and regulations that govern them. And the korbanot with all the rules and regulations that govern them are uh, are, are uh, boundaried and that's that that's also a symbol of what is beginning to evolve in this society. Uh, just as boundaries were crossed with Nadiv, Nadav and Avihu, our text now admonishes us not to cross boundaries in all aspects of life. Do not cross the boundaries of sobriety and intoxication. Do not cross the physical boundaries that we spoke about at the beginning with the eighth day. Uh, do, not, do not cross the boundaries of how to enter, how and when to enter the tent of meeting. Do not cross the boundaries of consumption. There's a rules about kashrut and what is not. And do not cross the boundaries of korbanot, etc. So all of this is part of creating categories, creating order, creating a world that is not, not chaotic, that is orderly, and will uh, stand the test of an orderly, civilized society. Camilla? Um, I guess I, I'm, I'm hearing that, but I'm also thinking they want to control events. In other words, like the sacri you know, a lot of things happen that people don't like, you know, the crops don't grow, people die, and you want a sense of that you can affect this. So the sacrifices are one, but then maybe kashrut, in other words, if we're good, we eat just the right things, we eat the way God wants us to eat then we won't have bad things happen to us. Do you think that there might have been? Absolutely. That Absolutely, that the laws of kashrut are, along with every other boundary that is set in this parsha, have to do with uh, action and reaction, with uh, uh, deed and consequence. And which essentially is what the covenant is all about. Mm -hmm. This is a relationship where God uh, offers us mitzvot and the mitzvot, the commandments, are now given to us in such a way that we have a choice 
But once we have bound ourselves to that covenant in the Israelite mind, there are consequences to breaking it. And that's why these boundaries are so important. We have a, we have a life and a world that is uh, created to by God with us in partnership to create a world that is orderly and that has ethical principles and that has behavioral principles and and that has legal principles. And all of these together create a world that we can live in. Without them, there would be a word, uh, there's a word in Hebrew, hefker. And hefker uh, means chaos, essentially. So there's a real fear of descending into a world of chaos. So everything has boundaries. And, and, and even, you know, there's a, a phrase, a phrase that the rabbis in Talmudic times uh, talk about. They say, we have to have a siag Torah. We have to have a fence around the Torah. And I think it's not uh, coincidental that that's the word that's used. Boundaries. Everything has boundaries around it. So I'm looking now again. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, Ralph suggests that perhaps they, they were drunk and they themselves took off their tunics. Is that what I'm understanding correctly, Ralph? Very possible. Uh, Luther, if you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dress stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, on your private, or your private parts may be exposed. Um, can you comment on that, Luther? What was your intent there? Well, because we were talking about Noah being drunk and his nakedness exposed and the possibility of uh, not of and Abihu either being drunk or being undressed or both. It just seemed like another part of the text where you're talking about boundaries and dignity and not compromising dignity. I think that's I think that's that's definitely on the mark and it's also uh, goes back to um, the uh, admonitions again uh, not against but to uh, Aharon about dignity and decorum in the way he mourns um, because if you if if yeah. he if he exposes himself, and I'm using that word meta metaphorically now, uh, then that too is going to break, it's going to cause fissures, fissures in the orderly way of their world. If the, if the priest, if the high priest acts in a way that is uh, not dignified, he's exposing himself and thereby the entire priesthood. And it's very similar to what you wrote here. Yeah, dignity playing a large role makes sense. The Israelites were not long out of slavery when they, when they did not have dignity. Absolutely. And they create a hierarchy. They have expectations of their leadership. They have expect expectations of the high priest. And they have expectations of Moses. And that's why, that's precisely why when Moses in anger hits the rock, and hits it twice, and it's very clear that this is an anger, um, he's punished for that, and he's punished very severely. What happens to him when he hits that rock in anger twice? He can't go to the promised land. Exactly, he can't go to the promised land. That's the ultimate severest of punishments. It's the maximum punishment. You, Moshe, are expected to maintain a certain dignity and a certain um, uh, patience with the people. You are, you are the pater familias. You are the father of the family in a sense. And at that moment, he's lost it. But he knew that, he knew that he wasn't gonna get into the promised land before he hit that rock. But the people- Because he was, he was told, yes, everybody knew that. Because when the tribes came back, when the spies came back, and only Kaleb and Yafuna 
Hakol of Yefuna and Yehoshua gave gave positive. It was said right then. These are the only two guys from the original people who are going into the land. So Moshe understood at that point when the when the when the tri, when the spies came back that he wasn't going into Canaan. I think it's an argument from silence myself. I think it doesn't ever explicitly say, even though, even there, I mean, it says that Yoshua and Kalev and Caleb, Joshua, and um, there's one more. Well, it doesn't matter. That, that, that never explicitly says, and you, Moshe, will not go. It's only after the rock that it says it explicitly. And the people, still see him as their father, as their, as their leader. And he breaks that dignity. He breaks the boundary of dignity. And I think, Barb, you're right that um, for a people, and I've, I said it, I think, last week or the week before, they were children when they came out of, uh, out of Egypt, and they were growing up. And they needed exemplars of dignity and decorum and consistency. And when he broke that, that was a shock to them. That was a shock to them. But the main thing that, that um, I really want to emphasize is the boundariness that comes in, not only, co it's, it comes in before this, but this Parsha, with all its different topics, is really about that, is really about that. Any other responses to any piece of the, Parsha, before we conclude today. Steve. I, I guess I posted it earlier, but one that uh, continually comes back for me is this tension between um, dying for God or giving, you know, being held up as holy, having sacrificed one's life for God. Um, versus the, uh, the very severe concern about those who would invoke God's name in killing people or, you know, uh, you know, terrorists or otherwise. So there's this tension about, um, you know, how one, far one should go. Um, um, of course, uh, in death, we, I think the expressions of grief and mourning are, are, um, appropriate um, towards the memory of the individual, not necessarily towards um, the act of death, per se. Right, right. A lot of people have uh, find the whole issue of Kiddush Hashem and the sanctification of God, uh, the name of God to be very, very complex and very problematic. So it's not, uh, it's not something that we need to take lightly at all. Uh, Bob? Uh, it, uh, regarding the silence um, of Aaron, um, you know, there, there was really nothing for him to say. Uh, in so many other instances, you know, there's, there are appeals, you know, we starting with uh, Abraham appealing for the Sodom and Gomorrah and all sorts of places where before God acts, um, there's there's notice, and either Moshe or Abraham or someone is is able to plead with God for their case. There's no due process here. Uh, yeah, and, and it's kind of mystifying um, that there either you take accept it that what they did was so sanctified that it was an honor, or what they did was such a horrible disgrace. That they had that there was, even Korach sort of had had an, he had a trial right, um, but here there's not there's nothing and it it really always always struck me that um, mo, I think Aaron was struck dumb. I mean, you know, yes, you could say that si there's beauty in silence, but also there was nothing for him to say or do. It all happened, and he was just a bystander. Right. It was without warning. It was without yeah. warning. absolutely. That's a good point. That's a good point. I think the last comment for the day will go to Ralph. The, I also wanted to connect the dots to this back to the uh, the Akeda and the whole thing about the admonition about human sacrifice. Is there a connection here 
because I think as, a, as I was saying in the post earlier, a lot of other religions, human sacrifice is a big part of it. So do, do people ever comment about this as a, as a admonition about human sacrifice as well? Um, there are some comments, but it's not a, it's not a common theme. It's not a common theme. On that subject, I wanted to recommend a book that I just became aware of called The Trial of Abraham by Carol Delaney. And what, what she does in that book, it's, it's more than just the biblical story. She um, talks about uh, the Akedah, and she then talks about human sacrifice, and then she goes on that. She's a an anthrop cultural anthropologist, and then she goes on to talk about the sacrifice of our children, not so much in the biblical sense, but in what our society does to our children. It's mm -hmm. a very, very interesting book. Carol Delaney. Wow. Okay, I think we are done for today. And we have one more session. I have one more session with you. That's Tazria next week, which is also a uh, complicated uh, uh, also a complicated book. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me, Barb. Uh, a new book that has just come out by my colleague and friend, uh, Rabbi Toba Spitzer, which I have right here and I'm so excited about. It's called God is Here, Reimagining the Divine. Rabbi Spitzer is a Reconstructionist rabbi. There's a lot of Reconstructionism in here, but a lot be far beyond that as well. And I highly recommend it to you. If any of you are going to the Reconstructing Re uh, Judaism conference, she will be there and she can sign it for you and you can talk about it. And um, she, it's, a great, it's a great book. So um, I will also be there with my book, uh, Listening to the Heart of Genesis, and if you would like to have a signed copy, I'll be happy to do that too. And uh, Rabbi Spitzer's uh, session is Friday morning, mine is Shabbat afternoon. Okay, I will be looking forward to my last session with you next week. Thank you, and just a reminder for folks, um, tomorrow night at 7.30, uh, Jerome Kapolsky is going to be starting his teaching on the book of Samuel and the Davidic line. Um, he'll be teaching uh, the next two Thursday evenings from 7.30 to 9 o'clock, a little bit longer because he only has two sessions with us. It should be absolutely fascinating. Um, I also, at the last email that I sent out for this class included the selections that he'd like us to read from uh, Samuel 1 and 2 if you can. So hope to see many of you there tomorrow night. And Layla, again, thank you so much. And uh, we will celebrate next week in your last class. <laughs> I'll bring the cake. <laughs> you should bring us something for a Lachaim. <laughs> Audrey, yes, indeed. Uh, Audrey, yeah. I have a question. Is, is there anything planned for Wednesdays after next week, or is, is nothing on the books? Well, I, um, I have to check with Rabbi Rachel and see what her plans are when she's coming back. Um, mm -hmm. The thought was she was going to continue teaching. I just want to confirm that I don't know at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. So we will see. I mean, we can't just leave it right here, but we'll have to uh, put our heads together. Um, we'll see. I'll let you know, okay? okay. You guys will be the first to know. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so Bye. much, Layla. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Layla Bamidbar, Parak Yud Dalit. Okay, I'll look it up.